We tend to think about the perfect boyfriend as a figure contained in a body. A picturesque silhouette, chiseled features, and a smile that glimmers in Instagram feeds, posters, and so on. But we tend to overlook certain features of these images that frame these perfect bodies. While we gaze at a portrait, we might notice a constructed scene behind the figure. Light, shadow, textures, furniture, clothing, and an environment of some kind. In certain portraits, constructing the background is an act that is inseparable from the depiction of the portrait's figure. In Untitled number 175, Cindy Sherman diminishes her figure. Her face is apparent only in the mirrored coating of a pair of sunglasses. In the foreground, she places candy bar wrappers, half-eaten pastries, and a towel soiled with vomit, all located within a blue-hued, sandy beach scene. It is, perhaps, an image of self-inflicted pain in the pursuit of attaining a beach body ideal. By contrast, Hyacinth Rigaud positions Louis XIV within a royal primitive hut. Louis's body is enshrouded in billowing, luxurious fabrics that part like the Red Sea at the command of his gold staff, revealing a pair of perfect pins propped up on platform pumps. Louis's portrait positions the background as an accessory to the primary figure. Cindy Sherman's portrait sets itself apart from others in suggesting that the scene's ephemera is, in some way, the figure of the painting itself. The perfect boyfriend builder constructs a portraiture of the spatial surround, a cheeky mise-en-scene built by desire. Shuffling through sets of references, it attempts to visualize the perfect boyfriend by building the locations in which he might be found. A bustling city street at dusk. A cozy but kitschy suburban attic. A moody movie set in a remote location. the bridge of a cargo ship in a tempestuous squall. Or a clandestine and lascivious sculpture gallery. Simultaneously, each scene is uniquely framed and developed with media and aesthetic categories that are related to the references at hand. A nostalgic scene may use painterly techniques in Photoshop and a 5 to 3 aspect ratio, while a playful scene might employ game engine shaders on a 16 to 9 HD screen. As a result, unique portraits are composed of apparent elements, but they nonetheless reveal certain narratives related to the creation of an ideal subject. When I was young, I uh, started teaching myself how to draw in perspective. I was given a set of drafting tools that my mom had when she was in design school, and they came in a suede tote bag. But it came with a perspective book. I skipped to the good stuff at the end of the book to learn how to set up a horizon line and vanishing points and all that. But I skipped over... Um, how to start with a plan and elevation, and how to determine a field of view to set up the drawing. I would start by drawing one of two objects. On the one hand, it would be uh, something that was at the scale of furniture or at a human scale. So if I set out uh, drawing, say, a chair, I would draw the chair first, and based on the chair's qualities, that would determine 
the vanishing points. And then I would continue constructing a chair from there. I would add other objects. I would layer them, scale different things, and create a composition in which the architectural surround was kind of... uh, a last concern and it resulted in these kind of bland architectural spaces but interesting still lifes that referenced architectural digest magazines the loft in that sitcom show that my parents were watching or photo journals from around the world but if i started drawing an object at the scale of a building i would start with the rationale that would produce interesting forms. I would draw the construction lines really lightly with 2H lead and fill in the B-spline that would ultimately become a wild spiral staircase uh, with a brutalist style finished and rendered in uh, board-formed concrete set in the middle of kind of like a fantastic architectural setting that had no objects in it. It was just a building. I would reference the construction of the Denver Art Museum, for example, that I was watching happening live when I was young. Or I would reference the postcards that my dad would send me from New York when he went on business trips, fascinated with these buildings that were objects in their own right. And all these drawings carried somewhat of an improvisational tone in their construction, but they were constantly in pursuit of two distinct priorities. On the one hand, some drawings prioritized aesthetics, But on the other hand, the drawings that were more interested in exploring form were interested in investigating the rationale of organization. And in retrospect, I could divide my first portfolio that I ever made with these graphite drawings into two categories. One that was kind of interested in the recombination of cultural references for the sake of creating some kind of domestic scene, and another that was interested in pushing the boundaries of organizational rationale. And I wonder if there's kind of a queer idea in working in those two separate ways, being the same person, but kind of engaging in different aesthetic languages at the same time as I was teaching myself how to draw, which again, I don't think would have been possible if I hadn't taught myself how to draw the wrong way. Thank you.